I'm Philip Marsh, Managing Director of Mentoring for Success. I'd like to talk to you about something we call the Mentors Toolkit. Before we get into it, I'd like to discuss why we need a toolkit. It's really important that mentors and mentees have the ability to build mental models to come together for their conversations. And the latest evidence and all the research shows very clearly that experts perform best in this space over there from their own learned guided experiences. But we spend too much time on training and development in the classroom. That only accounts for about 10% of what a really effective expert is all about. But in mentoring, we also need to cover this very important component, which is what we learn from others, or what we call vicarious learning. So we want to be able to get across the whole spectrum of learning opportunities, but primarily stay in this area, the 90%, which we call experiential wisdom. So we've developed something called the Mentors Toolkit. This is made up of essentially three components. The first component are some fairly basic communication and collaboration tools called the core toolkit. The second is more advanced and deals with emotional intelligence and it deals with some of the latest neuroscience techniques and learning styles, understanding the, uh, the coherence capabilities of the heart-brain conditioning. Um, and then something called the thinking mentor, which really deals in more detail with brain sensitized learning and memory formation. I would like to talk for the moment about the, the reason behind the toolkit. If we look at an expert, if we consider that in every one of our heads we have what is estimated as a hundred billion neurons or brain cells. Inside that head, those neurons brain cells are connected via a thousand trillion synaptic connections to the rest of our body and to the rest of our brain which means that we've got a, a, a sort of an incalculable number of connections that are made. So every person's brain is mapped completely differently to everyone else. How do we then try and transfer wisdom and knowledge from someone's brain who's wired together in such a complex formation to someone else's brain who's completely differently wired? So we want to ask simple questions. Who, what, where, when, how? And the, one of the things we do is to try and build mental mentorship models, a common model where mentor and mentee understand what they're trying to transfer and how they're doing it and why they're doing it. And it starts off in typical areas, what we call uh, tangible knowledge. It, it looks at the mentor's skills and knowledge. It looks at relationships and networks. Those are key in building a, a mentee's capability for the future. They're, they're key networks. The sources of knowledge, where do mentors get their key fundamental knowledge sources from? And then the processes and methods and behaviors, values and attitude, which are so important to success. So these are the tangible areas and we need tools and collaborative conversation starters to, to share those insights and those connections. And then we have a far more tougher area to look into as well, which is what we call the intangible knowledge. How do we share critical thinking? What makes an expert capable of walking into an environment and being able to think critically way beyond a less experienced person's capability? Hunches and intuition, where do these come from? Critical insights and gut feel. How do we map those? How do we share those? How do we transfer those? Experience and lessons from other projects, other events, uh, other job areas, uh, world insights and things like that. And then heuristics and rules of thumb. How do experts develop heuristics? In, the, in other words, how do they change what they're doing in the process of doing it and rules of thumb that they developed? So really what we're wanting to do is we're wanting to have conversations from the sources of wisdom, the sources of knowledge, and we're wanting to have this collaborative engaged discovery, taking this tacit knowledge, behaviors, experience, lessons, relationships, networks, putting it into a process of engaged discovery via mentoring where the mentees then take this on, it becomes explicit, they talk about it, and then it becomes implicit in the way they do their work. So essentially what we're wanting to do here is if we're looking at learning and memory formation and the different learning modalities, and if we look at the y-axis over here from zero to 100%, how do we optimize learning and memory formation and memory recall at 90 days? And if we're looking at the different learning modalities, our historical focus has always been on watch one and understand. It's to do with listening and learning, teaching. It's to do with lectures. It's to do with presentations. 
It's to do with a little bit of observation and things like that. And this builds very limited but initial context, which is important. This is what's known as semantic learning. It's the, it's the basic gathering of facts, figures, concepts, ideas, and models. But it has, at maximum, around a 30%, or 25 to 30% memory recall at about 90 days or 100 days. If we really want to incre increase that, we take it to the what we call do one, developing action potential. And what this does is the, the people, the mentees, now get involved in, in active simulations. They get involved in group collaborative discussion and participation. They develop knowledge assets. They, they develop processes and ideas, and they start to get the initial feedback. This builds a critical associative context. So it's not just facts and figures, but it's connecting those facts and figures in critical patterns. But if we really want to accelerate this up to about 90%, we need to take it to what we call teach one, which is building long-term capability. And this is the area of episodic learning. It's where the experts come into their own, and it's where they talk about their stories, the retrospective uh, investigation of particular events, and it's really in this space over here. So it's individuals practice and they get feedback. They participate in groups, and essentially the best way to get to this high level of memory retention is the mentees essentially become the mentors. They have to watch one, do one, teach one, and what they need to do is correct and show and improve the system or the learning for others. And that's really why we have a toolkit. So next I'd like to move into what the, the, the core tools and have an in-depth discussion on the first of the core tools. Okay, the next tool I'd like to take you through in the core tool set is what we call the six sources of learning. Six Sources of Learning is a tool set that is designed specifically to give mentors a different framework for where the mentees can actually go and acquire knowledge and learning and experience. The first element of this being experiential learning, and this is essentially where the mentor arranges for the mentee to go and participate in some work observation, being seconded to another department, shadowing an expert possibly, some group work, working in team projects, possibly some, some job coaching, uh, project work, simulations are very powerful, listening to stories of experts, and participating in something we call a retrospective analysis, looking at events or projects. And this is real life experiential learning. You remember what I said in the introduction, this is episodic learning. This is not purely about facts, figures, concepts and models. The second element is very important, which is learning materials. The mentee is given an opportunity to go and source different learning materials, and this could be books, journals, videos, e-learning, DVDs, CDs, uh, research documents, it could be through universities and colleges and things like that, anywhere where there are physical or virtual learning materials. The third element is learning assignments, and this is where the mentee is given a small project to work on as a research project or a means of gathering and packaging information together into a knowledge asset. And this could be through a bit of research, through working in collaborative forums, um, case studies specifically, putting together method statements, process evaluations, workflow analysis, things like that. And those are very useful to assess the, the quality and the quantity of learning the mentee has been able to pick up. The next element is, is obviously it's organizational company specific. And it's to do with policies, procedures, standard operating manuals, those sort of things. The, the SHEC documents, ISO documents, triple BEE, those sort of kinds of uh, areas, environmental stuff. And it's really what makes up the policies, procedures and manuals of an organization. The next element is classroom training, which unfortunately most often people rely on heavily. And you'll see it's right down here in the list. And this could be presentations, lectures, in-house workshops, public workshops, seminars, conferences training events, things like that, and it's really where groups of people sit in the classroom. And the last one is really very important. This is what we call people and benchmarks. As a source of learning, this is invaluable. So the mentor will help the mentee look for subject matter experts, knowledge networks, possibly knowledge mentors, specialists who, in, who have been allocated as knowledge mentors themselves. Um, innovation circles could be competitors, could be other industry players, communities of practice and things like that. So that's essentially the six sources of learning and what the mentor does is sit with the mentee, use a simple framework like this, look at the capability or the competency that the mentee is trying to acquire and obtain and become expert in 
and then just look at these. And you don't have to use all the six sources. You just cherry pick the two or three that are most appropriate and you would jot those down and it gives a nice learning framework and a plan for the mentee to work with. Of how the six sources of learning would be shared between a mentor and a mentee. Come in. Oh, Jumela Sinot. Mr. Mas. How are you? Good in yourself, Mr. Mas. Good day. Yes, sir. Nice to meet you again, sir. Yes, I just wanted to continue our conversations. Yes. Um, I've got a couple of minutes over here, and I thought we would continue the role that we see you play in project office support. Yes. And um, I'm using one of the tools that we were both trained in, uh, the six sources of learning, and I wanted to just go that uh, through with you quickly and uh, assist you in, in, in guided learning experiences. So the first one is um, experiential learning. Okay, sir. And as you know from the discussion we had in, this, in the six roles is that I'm going to put you in touch with John oh. uh, from Global Project Management. And what I'd like you to do is prepare anywhere between five and ten questions, oh. things that you would like to ask John. Um, those questions should really be regarding things that you uh, are inexperienced in and you would like to know more about how a big project management organization does things or how they overcome challenges. Okay, sir. And uh, what I've also arranged with John is possibly for you to have a, a site visit. He's going to organize for you to get out to a, a major site. And once again, what I would like you to think about there is um, pick selected people okay. on the site, uh, get permission from John, but I'd like you to interview those people. Right. And what I'm wanting you to do here is really build up some experiential learning. Oh. This is the, the learning from real people experiencing real problems. The, the next element of the tool that I wanted to suggest that you thought about is if you go on the internet, there's a website called the 10 Best Project Management Books. What I would like to suggest is that you go on the internet, find the website 10 Best Project Management Books, and select any one of those books. Download the book, you can buy it. Um, and what I'd like to do next time when we meet is that you and I just discuss why you chose that book, what you like about that book in particular, if you've learned anything about that book, if there's anything in that book that you want to discuss on the site when you're with John and his uh, project management team, and, and just generally try and relate the theory of the book to the practical aspects of, of being on a major site with a global project management organization. Okay, sir. We'll are, you, are you comfortable with that? Yes, I'll do this. The, the other thing I thought would be a really good idea is that um, why don't you look for a course, uh, a workshop or a course that you can do. Uh, there are people like Project Management South Africa or the School of Project Management or there's a variety of different places, the Project Management Institute, uh, some of the engineering institutions run project management courses. Find a project management course, uh, not to do full project management, but to do the project office support role. I think that would be worth, really worthwhile. So go and investigate what the costs are involved, how long is involved, and let's have a discussion around what you think would be a good project office. There are many training companies that do this. Okay, um, have a look around, see what you think is, uh, try and get some advice. Possibly John or Pam could give you some insights into which course they think is best. I think would be good. And then finally, the people in benchmarking, what I would like you to do is in your discussions with Pam and John, yes. I would like you to try and identify five characteristics that you think are similar between Pam and John, which are the characteristics of successful project management. They're two very different people. They have very different styles. I would like you to try and investigate what are the five things you think that they do that are similar that are make them into very effective project managers? So, no, I think that's probably around all we have time for right now. Uh, do you have any questions? No, I don't, sir. Then let me suggest that we get together in about three weeks' time. Okay. Give me some feedback in about three weeks. I think I'll have to check my diary first there and then I'll come back to you. Fantastic. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, sir. Have a lovely day. Bye. Bye.